Today we're going to discuss the design process. This will be the process that you will use when you do your group design projects for this semester. These projects will be handed in in stages and the stages um, are part of the process um, that I'm going to go through right now. There are many different ways of expressing the design process. First, generally there is an identification of need um, an identification of need is something that will generally come from your manager. Um, someone above you has decided that there is something that needs to be designed. And from that, you will go through the following steps. You will go through uh, background research. Um, you will generate a goal statement, uh, performance specifications, ideation and invention, which may require additional background research, some analysis, selection, detailed design, and some prototyping and testing. Now, of the things that you see here, um, it's important that we note that while they do proceed in this manner, there can be some loopbacks, like you see from ideation and invention loops back to background research. Um, what we will do, um, we will always say to a group, to your design team, that it is possible for you to go back and add something to a previous piece if you feel like you've left something out. And this will become more apparent as we go through. Your hand-ins, your group hand-ins will be um, compiled according to this chart. So, for example, in the beginning, um, we may say that for your first deliverable, you may turn in your identification of need, your background research, and your goal statement. You will be judged on those um, three things together. After that, um, your performance specifications, your ideation and invention may come next. Um, and then you may do analysis and selection. And finally, for your final hand-in, you will do a detailed design and your prototype. So this process is a real process that you can use even in industry and maybe even next year when you do senior design. But it is also a process that we will utilize and you will learn about in this class. In particular, the design process leads to successful designs. Um, it produces exciting solutions. It prevents duplications and patent infringement, just in case there's other stuff out there, right? When you do your background research, you'll find out if someone else has done a similar design. It opens up or opens to us new paradigms, um, new ways of thinking. It helps us make qualitative choices between different options in our design. And it foreshadows our future. In other words, it, it tells us what we're going to end up with even before we've gotten to that point. So we don't go down too many dead-end roads, in other words. Identification of need. What we're going to do now is we're going to go through each of these steps from the previous slide and kind of talk about each one of them um, in order. Identification of need. That, that is basically a question that says, what do they want from me? Who's they? They is your manager, um, the company, um, an investor, um, maybe even a general consumer. Someone wants something from you. You are the designer. The identification of need is what do they want? Sometimes the identification of need is called a problem statement or a statement of need. It's done for you normally by someone else. And in this class, it will be done to, for you by me. So you will not be judged on your identification of need because that is something that I will give to you. It is brief. It is lacking in detail and structure, okay? So it's not something that's going to be giving you a lot of um, equations. It's definitely not going to give you any equations. It won't give you too much by way of velocities or a lot of variables, right? It's going to be brief, um, and it's going to be kind of um, vague in a way. An example of an identification of need may be we need a new seesaw. Or um, someone may come to you and say, hey, we need a new bicycle, right? So they're, they're telling you what the end goal is, but they haven't given you too much detail. Page 170 in your book starts the various design project descriptions. These are statements of need or identifications of need. Uh, as an example, um, number six, 
on that page 170 says, the National House of Flapjacks wants to automate their flapjack production. They need a mechanism which will automatically flip the flapjacks on the fly as they travel through the griddle on a continuously moving conveyor. This mechanism must track the constant velocity of the conveyor, pick up a pancake, flip it over, and place it back onto the conveyor. So that's, that is an example of identification of need. That one isn't exactly brief, right? Has a couple of sentences there, but it's an identification of need. It hasn't told you how to do this, um, how fast you need to do it, how many you need to do per hour, or anything like that. It's just basically telling you kind of what you need to do in this um, particular problem. Um, 310 says, the coin-operated kid bouncer, this is on page 171 in your book, the coin-operated kid bouncer machines found outside supermarkets typically provide a very unimaginative rocking motion to the occupant. There is need for a superior bouncer, which will give more interesting motions while remaining safe for small children. Another example of identification of need. And again, this is something that I will provide for you in the class. Um, there will be more than one identification of need given, and the groups can choose from the ones that I provide. Next step, background research. This is where you search, you read, and you learn. Often, this is a neglected step, sometimes the most neglected step, because it forces you to read. Many people don't want to read. This is where you find out what methods or products already exist. So what, what are you doing? You're assessing the competitor's products. This is called benchmarking. So if you're designing a flapjack flipper or a kid bouncer, you want to look at the other companies that make those products and see what is out there. You don't want to try to reproduce something that's already out there. You're going to, for therefore, you're going to check patents. You're going to search the web. You're even going to visit stores. In the past, um, when kids in the class have um, gone about maybe developing an amusement park ride as an example, um, they've gone to the fair, the Tallahassee Fair, the, I think they call it the North Florida Fair, is normally, uh, well, always in the fall semester. And so students have gone out, looked at the fair, looked at some of the rides to get more ideas. Avoid reinventing the wheel. You will learn a great deal by studying state of the art, right? <clears throat> so you're looking at things that exist, but you're not recreating something that already has an easy method of doing it, right? So if there's already something that carries someone or shakes someone in a certain manner, you don't want to recreate that same exact thing. Some branching from your main idea will be helpful. Okay, so in other words, you have some idea of something you want to do, but when you go out there, you start reading, you will come up with slightly different things as you read, things that help you accomplish the same task. Let's look at an example. How about background research for a lawnmower? Someone has said, hey, we want a, a, a something to cut grass, and you're going on, you're looking into what other lawnmowers are there out there. So you might consider the history of lawnmowers. So you go back and start looking at, well, what was the first lawnmower like? Characteristics of grass, right? If you're going to create something that's going to cut grass, then you're going to need to look at um, things like the types of grass there are, the density of grass, the strength of grass, because you know there's many different types of grass. Cutting mechanisms based on what? Your cutting mechanisms could be clippers, they could be scissors, they could be lasers, right? Where it could be some futuristic type of lawnmower. You could use water jets. There's many different ways of cutting things. You might look at patent literature. What other ways have people come up with the cut grass? Maybe they haven't ever been made into products, but there's a patent on it and you can't use it. So that's a good thing to look for, patent literature. And you can do that kind of search also on the computer online. Here's an example. Seesaw. The background research for a seesaw. Different types of seesaws, right? Government regulations for playground equipment. Right, So there's going to be certain regulations, maybe federal, maybe state, on the kind of seesaw you can now have. Maybe you can't have the kind of seesaw that they had when you were growing up, based on a lot of kids getting hurt. They have, they have added new regulations. Insurance rates. Branching. Maybe some rates are very high. So in other words, going back to that insurance rates, if 
the insurance rates on a certain type of seesaw are very high, maybe that will take you in a different direction, lead you to developing a different type of seesaw. It could even lead you to not developing a seesaw at all, but developing some other kind of playground ride, which does something similar, right? It gives two kids or multiple kids the opportunity to do something together, to share and play together, but it doesn't have the same safety problems that a seesaw has. That's what we mean by branching. What about other types of playground rides, such as a swing, a spring horse, a merry-go-round? If you think about it, you could say, well, a spring horse and a swing, these are not necessarily things that kids do together, right? A kid does this kind of by himself. But a merry-go-round is something that two kids could do together. So if you were originally thinking of seesaws because you wanted something that kids could work or play on together and you branch away from that because the insurance rates are so high, maybe it would be better to go to merry-go-round than it would go to uh, than it would to go to swing or spring horse. So this is just some examples of background research on a particular identification of need which would be design a new seesaw. And you also have amusement park analogies. Um, you may notice that a lot of playground um, equipment has kind of larger motorized analogs in an amusement park. So if you're asked to design a new seesaw or a new playground ride, you may go to an amusement park to get some ideas of things that people like and then come up with versions that are human powered for the playground. Next, developing a goal statement. So now you've completed your background research and it's time to develop a goal statement. A goal statement is where you recast the problem statement or the um, identification of need into a coherent goal. First, you fully understand the problem area background because you've done your background research. The seesaw statement, instead of something like develop a new seesaw, becomes something like design an oscillating playground ride or kid-powered ride. Okay, So you've taken your statement, your seesaw statement, your seesaw identification of need, and you've recaptured it into something that is concise and leaves you room to design. So design an os os oscillating playground ride or kid-powered ride. Avoid traps of restrictive words and phrases when you're developing your goal statement. So you're saying oscillating playground ride. You're not saying anything about um, it must go up and down because, of course, it could go side to side, right? So you don't want to be too restrictive in your phraseology so that you hamper or restrict, overly constrict your design. Use functional visualization. In other words, avoid limiting your creativity. A bad choice of words would be to say, design a better lawnmower. If you say lawnmower, what are people going to start thinking about? What instantly comes into your mind when someone says lawnmower? You start thinking, oops, one second.